Okay, so uh, the uh, title of today's talk is 30 for 30, and some of you who watch ESPN will recognize that logo, but the reason I'm using it is it signifies a 30% reduction in 30-day hospital readmissions. And this is very important today. In fact, last week, CMS announced the penalties for hospitals in the United States who did not meet their criteria, their quality metrics in terms of readmission rates. And in fact, 75% of hospitals in the United States received a penalty. This is going to get people's attention. Uh, I started out in this in 2008, uh, because in 2008, uh, the hospital readmission rate for uh, heart failure patients was 25%. And I had no idea of that. Uh, at that time, I became the um, uh, heart failure champion for Sutter and everybody focused my attention on this and said, we've got to do something about this. And in fact, uh, we started working on it. So over the years, let's go to 2018. Now that's a 25% readmission rate nationwide. And uh, just this year, the nationwide readmission rate is 22%. So over 10 years, basically we've done very little. We've dropped the readmission rate from 25% to 22% nationwide, although we've spent a lot of time talking about it. And the data here is shown to you. Uh, this is a CMS graph showing the uh, readmission rate at the top, but you'll also notice that as that declines slightly, the number of emergency room visits and observation visits goes up. So the net effect has really been little to nothing. Now, why is this? What is the reason? Uh, well, what hospitals did, and that's the big circle that you see here, what the hospitals did, does that mouse show up when I, when I do this? No. Okay. Is they put a lot of emphasis here on all sorts of things that, in fact, did not matter. They thought that these things are going to change the outcome. Well, the fact is that what happens in the hospital stays in the hospital. Patients do not remember a single thing that you tell them when they're in the hospital, particularly when they have a medical illness. The second problem is up here on the upper uh, right-hand corner. The outpatient providers, they did not get the information. They were not the beneficiaries of any of the things that were going on in the hospital, and certainly, the patients and caregivers, they were all separated. And that's the main reason that that happened. And so I went around the hospital ward and I asked the question, why, how come Mrs. Smith is back? I figured I'll go to the source. You know, in those days we could write Mrs. Smith on the chalkboard in the hospital. You can't do that anymore. But anyway, I asked those questions and here were the answers that I got. She didn't take her medications. She drank too much water. She couldn't fill her prescriptions. She ate too much salt. She likes her hospitalist, wanted to come back and visit him or her. She has no home and lives here, a problem. And then there was this one, she's a frequent flyer. Now this is a term that's pejorative and should be eliminated from medical language altogether. And then finally, she didn't get the instructions right. Well, guess what? it's incumbent on the hospital and on the providers to give the right instructions. Notice that everything here blames the patient, and that's not correct. So when you look at people who said, we gave the right instructions, and you look at the lowest and highest quartiles of hospitals, you see the readmission rate didn't matter. Yeah, give them the right instructions. It did not matter. What mattered was what came up next, and that is that 55% of patients who were readmitted to the hospital did not see a doctor within 30 days of leaving the hospital. And that was demonstrated by Jenks uh, uh, from Medicare uh, uh, data. 
So, as a result of that, the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology created a system called h to h and you can look at the details of this, but basically h to h says make sure the patient gets an appointment within one week and make sure they get there. Well, that sounds great, but it doesn't always work either. So you notice I have the little open table logo here, and part of the reason for that is that if you look at the trends in medicine, what has happened? Length of stay has dropped. That's the mandate from the hospital. Drop the length of stay. And as a result of that, the 30-day readmission rate went up. This is for the years 93 to 2006. This is what got us into trouble. And this data comes from Harlan Krumholtz, who really is the guru of hospital uh, readmission work. Uh, and he's at Yale University. And there's no doubt about this. Why do I have open table here? Because if you try and make a reservation at a good restaurant in San Francisco on Saturday night at 7.30, you will not be able to do that. And why is that? It's simple. The owner of the restaurant knows that if he gets somebody in at 5.30, he gets one serving, and then he gets a second group in at 8 o'clock. And but if he puts somebody in at 7 o'clock, he's only going to get one serving. So he will, he will have two customers instead of one. And the same is true under the DRG system. Because in the DRG system, what happens? Patient comes in, you get $12,000 for heart failure. They go home, you get another, in three days, you get another patient in. Three more days, you've made $24,000. But if one patient stays six days, uh-uh, you only made $12,000. And it's simple math. So that there's a, in the lower right-hand corner, length of stay and readmission rate are inversely proportional. So what is the solution? Uh, the solution must be technology. Let's bring all these three together with technology. And it's a good idea, but it didn't work. And if you look here, these, this is data from uh, Krumholtz's study looking at telemonitoring of heart failure patients when they went home, and you can tell from these curves there's no difference between the control group and the treatment group. But wait a second, I told you we did better than that, and we did, because what we did was we first started out with what we called a discharge clinic. We saw the patients at the, ho at the hospital within a week, and we dropped the readmission rate from 18% down to 10.6%, and that's for that one year period. But every hospital can't have a discharge clinic. It's hard to do that. How are you gonna keep track of those patients? Well, we set up a telemonitoring system, and we produced a 30% reduction in readmission rates. Now, you'll notice here, these, this is data for California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco, and this is the HSAC data, the Health Services Administration Group. And you can see here that compared to patients discharged home and patients who went to skilled nursing, we dropped the readmission rate down to 17% for that group of patients with heart failure. And how did we do it? What we did was we did medication reconciliation in the home with patients, we did all of these things that I've listed here. We had telemonitoring, and basically, we made sure the patient got to see a doctor within a week as well. In a meta-analysis of this uh, data, you can see here that when you have telemonitoring or structured telephone support systems to a machine, it doesn't work. The risk reduction is not there. It's 1.06, so it's worse. But when you have a human being on the other end of the line, things do work, and you can see the risk reduction drops to 0.76. And actually, just last week, and I've included this slide at the last minute, uh, a study from Germany with 1,500 uh, patients showed that in an intervention group which had telemonitoring and 24-7 telemonitoring center that had nurses and physicians associated with it that could give advice and get patients back in. The intervention group had 18 hospital days per year, but the usual care group, 24. The deaths were diminished as well, and the composite between the two obviously favored the usual, the, um, excuse me, the intervention group. Well, this is actually not new. This is data from uh, UCLA's heart failure, heart transplant clinic, and it shows that they did the same thing when they had a, 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 a patients on the left. 
where patients referred for heart transplant, their number of hospitalizations are there, and on the right, after they instituted this program uh, with various things. But the important thing here is this paper was published in 1997, 20 years ago. So yes, where have we been for the last 20 years? So my conclusion is 30-day readmissions are not a patient problem. I'm told I'm running out of time, and I've just given you a uh, one-hour Grand Rounds lecture in 10 minutes, so I hope you appreciate that. My conclusions, 30-day readmissions are not a patient problem. They are a system problem, but by combining coordinated care with technology, we can improve the quality of care we delivered. Thank you. No. Thank you so much, Ed. Any questions? Dr. Kirsch, thank you. That was excellent. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the discharge clinic and what exactly would transpire, and then also how many, was it one encounter with that patient, or were there a series okay. of encounters? Thank you. So what we did was we, um, we had a cardiology clinic at the hospital, and we got everybody on board. That was the key. So the hospitalist, the uh, ward clerk, the nurses, everybody knew that if you picked up the phone and called this number, somebody on the other end would give that patient appointment for the discharge clinic. It was always on Thursday afternoon every week. So we captured every patient who was discharged within one week. But everybody had to be on board, including the private doctors because we weren't trying to steal their patients, we were trying to help everybody, and they got that message. And so they were not threatened by the fact that I might be seeing Dr. X's patient, because we, at, at the discharge clinic, we would triage them off back to their primary doc, another referring cardiologist, or to our cardiology clinic if they didn't have somebody. And everybody was happy with that situation, and everybody was on board with it. And that was, of course, the important part. Yeah. Dr. Kirsch, a uh, quick question. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation. Um, quick question about uh, use of observation status to reduce hospital re readmission and how can your program be used for patients with difficult psychosocial problems and Medi-Cal populations and safety net hospitals? So That's the question is about observation status, and what's the last part of your question? Uh, safety net hospitals with lower psychosocial. Uh, oh, okay. All right, well, uh, part of the talk that I didn't give you has to do with the psychosocial challenged patients, and the fact that you can, in fact, manage those patients properly if you have the right systems in place. Now, observation is a very interesting phenomenon. I've told uh, the people at my hospital, if I ever come into the ER, do not admit me to observation. And the reason is that observation is a gimmick, and it's a gimmick for the hospital, because if a patient comes back and they're admitted for two days under observation, they are not a true readmission. So they don't go in the penalty column. That's the first thing. The second thing, going back to our open table, uh, is when you come in under observation, you are an a la carte patient. That means every Tylenol, every IV, every everything goes down as a separate a la carte item, and it's not part of a DRG. And not only that, it's under Medicare B. It's not under Medicare A. Observation is an outpatient service under Medicare B, and your patient, when they get home, will get a bill for 20%. And so you'll get a patient who's not very happy either. So that's my feeling about observation, but unfortunately, the hospital administrators and the hospitalists have push that because it's to their benefit, not the patient's benefit. Last question there. So it's a great talk. I'm a Thank hospitalist you. myself, so I know these challenges. So the one challenge is coming. We are trying to reduce the 30 days readmissions. With the bundle payments, it will be 90 days now. So what do you think down the road, uh, you know, how you can replicate this from 30 days to 90 days and be successful in readmissions? That's one question. 
The other well, let me let me yes. just deal with that one. We this is evolving. And so 30 days is now going to be 90 days, as you've pointed out. And not only that, it's going to go back in time to when the per patient first started having any kind of illness. So there's going to be accountable care for that entire period of time. And in addition to that, Medicare is going to track how much money you spent during those 90 days. <coughs> and eventually, you're going to be the one on the hook for that you being the hospital system. So I think the 30 day was our opportunity to get ourselves, to get, to get our game up to, up to shape, but this 90 day period is gonna be more challenging. What's the second question? The other is, it's a quick, like your process, you know, um, how you navigate, how you, you have a navigator in the hospital, okay. you have the nurse practitioners, the nurses calling the patients and monitoring those, or how you do that? Okay, so yeah, we have a navigator at the hospital, and I've had some extensive conversations with her. And basically she says to me, it's very easy when you have a patient who comes in with a heart attack, and they get a stent, and they're in the hospital for maybe two days, and they're a true believer now because they've just had this acute event. But it's very different when you're a navigator trying to work with a patient who has chronic illness because those chronic illness patients do not hear what you have to say, and they are very susceptible to what we call post-hospital syndrome where they really just forget everything you've told them. So the hospital navigators have told me that yes, they will talk to the patient, but what they themselves perceive that those patients don't hear them. And it's true, if you talk to, uh, there've been studies done looking at uh, what patients hear and what people, the hospital says, we told them this, and then you ask the patient two weeks later, did you hear this? No. They didn't hear any of it. In fact, most patients don't even know the diagnosis that they had when they were discharged from the hospital. If you would have asked them, what was your diagnosis? Well, I don't know what it was. So I, I think you know that that's true. Yeah, this is a challenge. Okay, thank okay. you so much for that awesome, great talk. Right. Thank you.